Today we are discussing spatial coherence in optical systems. And the main formulas we will use are those that we have previously derived to describe the propagation of mutual intensity. So the most general result is that the mutual intensity at the output, J2, between two points, X1, Y1, and X2, Y2, is equal to a quadruple integral over the input of the coherent impulse response, H of X1, Y1, and input point Psi1, Eta1, times the conjugate of the impulse response, or output point X2, Y2, from input point Psi2, Eta2, times the mutual intensity at the input. So J1, between the two points, Psi1, Eta1, and Psi2, Eta2, and then integrated over those input points, D Psi1, D Eta1, D Psi2, D Eta2. And as the propagation of mutual intensity, input mutual intensity, output mutual intensity. Now the special case where the two output points are the same, we get formula for the output intensity. So we'll set x1 is equal to x2 is equal to x, y1 is equal to y2 is equal to y, and then we get i2 of x and y, and the only difference we have in our integral is still a quadruple integral, just that the x's are the same and the y's are the same. And we still have to do the quadruple integral over the input plane. Now, if we have spatially incoherent light at the input, and remember our simplistic model for this would be that J1, Psi1, Eta1, and Psi2, Eta2, would be constant K times the intensity I1 of Psi1, Eta1, and then a delta function in delta Psi and delta Eta, where Psi is equal to Psi1 and delta Psi is equal to psi2 minus psi1, and likewise for the eta's. So that's our simple model for spatially incoherent input. It has this, these delta functions. And with that, we get that the output intensity, i2 of x and y, is equal to that constant k. And the delta functions, of course, uh, trivially take care of two of these integrals. We end up then with just a double integral of the magnitude of h of x and y, psi and eta, magnitude of that squared, times the input intensity, i1 of psi and eta, integrated over the input plane, d psi, d eta. Where, just to re recall, J of x1, y1, psi1, eta1 
is equal to the time average of the amplitude at point x1, y1 as a slowly varying function of time times the conjugate of the amplitude at point 2, x2, y2, slowly varying function of time, where g of x, y, and t is its amplitude, a of x, y, and t, and then times e to the minus i, 2 pi, center frequency, nu zero, t. All right, that's our model for quasi-monochromatic light, where we assume that the, uh, the amplitude, or the envelope, A of x, y, and t, is such that it doesn't change uh, if we change t by some delta t corresponding to the, the maximum path difference within the system. And then this is time averaged over a very long period of time. So what we want to ask in this lecture is, What are the predictions from these formulas for the two lens systems that we have analyzed using wave optics Fourier transforming lens, and an imaging. Lens. So what do these, these formula predict? And let's look at the process of actually applying them to these two very practical systems. Begin with the Fourier transforming lens. So this has the following geometry. Here's an input plane. Here is a lens, focal length F, and here is an output plane. And these distances from input to lens and lens to output are both equal to the focal length f. Then if we use psi and eta for the coordinates at the input and x and y at the output, and we have now a monochromatic field with amplitude g1, psi and eta, and a monochromatic field at the output with amplitude g2, of x and y, we have analyzed the impulse response of this system to find that h of x and y for input psi and eta is equal to e to the i constant phase phi zero over i lambda zero f times e to the minus i two pi over lambda zero f times x psi plus y eta. And then g2 is equal to g1 times this impulse response integrated over the input plane psi and eta. And the result we get because of this factor here, uh, which is like the kernel of a Fourier transform, we get that the output g2 of x and y is equal to e to the i phi zero over i lambda zero f times the Fourier transform, big G one of the input field evaluated at spatial frequencies x over lambda zero f and y over lambda zero f. And then if we take the intensity magnitude squared of G2, call it I2. Now that's gonna be the magnitude squared of the right. And that reduces to one over lambda zero F quantity squared 
times the magnitude squared of big G1 at x over lambda 0 f y over lambda 0 f That's magnitude squared of that power spectrum of the input the output is basically proportional to the power spectrum of the input at these spatial frequencies so those were the monochromatic results that we've already derived now let's see what happens when we have light that has a partial or no spatial coherence. So let's start off with the easiest case, which is where we have no spatial coherence. We have a spatially incoherent input. Well, in that case, the impulse response for the intensity is the magnitude squared of the coherent impulse response, so the magnitude of h of x, y, psi, and eta. Magnitude squared of that is, well, this is a phase factor. Magnitude is 1. The i and the EVI phi 0 magnitude is 1. So that just leaves 1 over lambda 0 f quantity squared. It's just a constant. And so the output intensity in this case, I2 of x and y, is equal to, so the actual, we model the, um, the incoherent impulse response as this magnitude squared times a constant k, which is on the order of lambda 0 squared. So k over lambda 0 f squared, and then we have the integral of the input intensity, i1, psi, and eta, and there's no, in this, there's nothing that depends on psi and eta, so it's just that integrated over the input plane. And what is that? Well, that's this constant k over lambda 0 f squared, times, well, this is just the integral of the intensity over the whole plane. That's just the input power, call it P1. So we get that the output intensity at every point is equal to a constant proportional to the input power. And as we've already described in, in previous lectures, uh, this is based on the very simplistic model for a spatially incoherent input, where we assume that two points that are not precisely the same are totally incoherent, which uh, is, not a, is, is not the best model we could have, but it's the simplest model. And it works pretty good. But one of the downsides, as we've already pointed out, is we get this result here that uh, violates the conservation of power. We have a finite power, P1 at the input. This would say that the output intensity is uniform everywhere. And of course, if you have a finite intensity that is the same everywhere in an infinite plane, that's an infinite amount of power, which can't physically be the case. So we've, we've seen the resolution of that. If we use a more realistic model for the uh, spatial coherence of what we're calling a spatially incoherent input, uh, this k becomes a function of x and y and then takes care of that that uh, normalization and the power and the output is equal to the power of the input. But this is good enough for our purposes. It's telling us that the Fourier transforming lens is completely useless with spatially incoherent light. All right, its effectiveness comes from this phase factor. It's that integrated times the product of the input field that gives us the Fourier transforming property. And if we take the magnitude squared of that, well, that the phases all go away. And it was the phase of the impulse response that gave us this very useful property. So we completely lose that. So we're not getting any Fourier transforming effects with a single lens in this configuration when we have a spatially incoherent input. Now let's look at the general case of an input of partial spatial coherence. 
So to do the calculation for the propagation of mutual intensity, we need the quantity H of X1, Y1, Psi1, Eta1 times H conjugate of X2, Y2, Psi2, Eta2. And let's see, we'll have E to the I, phi zero over I, lambda zero F, times its conjugate, so that'll just give us one over lambda zero F quantity squared. And then we'll have phase factors, E to the minus I, two pi over lambda zero F, X one, psi one, plus Y one, eta one times the conjugate term e to the plus i two pi over lambda zero f x two psi two plus y two eta two. And now we put that into the formula for the propagation of mutual intensity, and we get that the mutual intensity at the output j two of x1, y1, x2, y2 is equal to, we got this constant factor in front, one over lambda zero f squared, and then we've got a quadruple integral of the product of these two factors, we'll write as one factor, e to the i, two pi, over lambda zero f, x2 psi two plus y2 eta two minus x1 psi one minus y1 eta one, just combining those two exponents, times the input mutual intensity, j1, between the points psi one eta one psi 2, eta 2, and then integrated twice over the input plane over d psi 1, d eta 1, d psi 2, d eta 2. So if we make the change of variable that we've done before, uh, writing psi is equal to the average of psi two and psi one, and delta psi is equal to the difference, psi two minus psi one. And then we can write that psi one is equal to psi minus delta psi over two, and psi two is equal to psi plus delta psi over two. And we look at the output intensity so that x1 is equal to x2 is equal to x, and likewise for the y and the eta's. Then we end up with an output intensity, i2 of x and y, uh, which is this constant one over lambda zero f squared, and now our integrals are going to be over psi and eta and delta psi and delta eta. And if we look up here at uh, this expression, if x1 and x2 are the same, well, then this just becomes x times psi2 minus psi1, which is x times delta psi. And likewise, this becomes y2 eta 2 minus y1 eta 1 when y1 and y2 are both equal to y just becomes y times eta 2 minus eta 1 or y times delta eta. And so that is a function only of delta psi and delta eta. And so the only thing that is in the integrand uh, for the integrals over psi and eta is the j1. And so we'll end up with an expression that looks like this. We'll have a double integral of a double integral. That double integral will be j1, and using these formulas here, psi1 is 
psi minus delta psi over 2, and likewise, um, eta 1 is eta minus delta eta over 2, and then psi 2 is psi plus delta eta over, over 2, delta psi over 2, sorry, uh, and eta plus delta eta over 2, and that's integrated over the psi eta plane. And once we integrate out the psi and eta dependence, it'll only be a function of delta psi and delta eta. And then we've got this term, which reduces to e to the i, 2 pi over lambda 0 f, as we've already said, right? x1 and x2 are both equal to x. And then you got psi 2 minus psi 1, which is delta psi, and likewise y delta eta. And we integrate that d delta psi, d delta eta. And we're going to call that equation star. So that gives us the output intensity for an input that has uh, arbitrary partial spatial coherence. So just to sketch out what we've done here with this change of variable, the idea is, and if we have if this is psi and eta, and we've got a point, right, which is like psi 1, and over here is another point, psi 2, and the corresponding eta coordinates are eta 1 and eta 2, then um, psi is the average of those, the midpoint, and likewise, eta is the midpoint. And then we've got the, the difference, psi 2 minus psi 1 is delta psi, and eta 2 minus eta 1 is delta eta. Let's look at the prediction of our equation for uh, the output intensity with partial input coherence for the special case we already know the answer for, and that is for a monochromatic input. And let's take as a specific example a G1 of psi and eta is constant amplitude A0 times a product of rect functions, rect psi over w, rect eta over w. Now we know because of the Fourier transforming property of the lens with monochromatic fields, the output should be proportional to the angular spectrum of the input, g1 of u and v, and Fourier transform of a rect is a sink, and then the we have the scaling theorem, so that's going to give us a0. We're going to get a factor of w for each rect, so that's w squared, and then we're going to get sinc wu, sinc wv. And then we're going to get, uh, for the intensity at the output, it's going to be proportional to the magnitude squared of that, so we're going to have i2, of x and y, let's see, magnitude squared of a0, we're calling that i0, and then we're going to have a w squared squared, and we also have a lambda 0 f squared. So we got those constants in front, and then the sinks are squared, and the spatial frequency is x over lambda 0 f and y over lambda 0 f, so we get wx over lambda 0 f and sinc squared wy over lambda 0 f. So that is what we should get for the output intensity. So let's see if this is true. Let's look at the prediction. <clears throat> 
of our equation star we had on the previous board. Uh, and we've set up an example here that's symmetric in x and y or psi and eta. So let's just work with a single coordinate, just the x and psi. coordinates. So with that, our formula predicts, well, let's first write down what the input mutual intensity is. J1 of psi 1, psi 2, remember we're not worrying about the, the eta coordinate, would be, by definition, uh, G1 of psi 1, times g1 conjugate of psi 2. And let's see, there'll be two factors of a0. We call that an i0. And a rectangle that is conjugate is still just the rectangle. So this will be i0 rect psi 1 or w rect psi 2 over w. Then for our integral, we need j1 of psi minus delta psi over 2, right? Remember, we're, we express psi 1 and psi 2 in the form of psi minus delta psi over 2 and psi plus delta psi over 2. So what's that going to be here? We plug it in this formula we got i0 rect of psi minus delta psi over 2 over w and then rect of psi plus delta psi over 2 over w and what is that well that's just the overlap of two rect functions. So that's either going to be 1 or 0. Let's uh, sketch this out. What's it going to look like? So if this is psi, and right there is 0, then and for one of these factors, we're going to have something that looks like this. And we'll say that's the rect of psi plus absolute value of delta psi over 2 over w. Uh, so if delta psi is positive, then, then that's actually going to be this term here. Uh, if delta psi is negative, then it would be this term. So there's going to be one, one or the other of these terms will produce uh, a rect that's shifted to the left. And it's shifted to the left so that um, this value right there is going to be, it normally would be w over 2 would be the right edge of the rect, but it's going to be offset by delta psi over 2. So this will be w minus magnitude of delta psi over 2. And then we also will have another rect, and I'll draw it downwards here so they don't overlap, which will look like this. And this will be rect of psi minus magnitude of delta psi over 2 all over w. And if delta psi is positive, then that'll be this term. If delta psi is negative, then it would be this term. And this will be shifted to the right. So that um, this point over here, well, it's just going to be the mirror image of this. So it's going to be just the negative of that. It's going to be minus w minus absolute value of delta psi over 2. So, as a function of psi, we see that this product will be non-zero. It'll be equal to 1 only if we are in 
this overlap region here. And so where is that? Well, that's where Xi uh, is an absolute value less than or equal to, to this, because it's between plus or minus that, that value. So this thing will be equal to, we've got a leading factor of I0, and times then times one, if the absolute value of Xi is less than or equal to W minus the magnitude of delta Xi all over two and zero otherwise. Okay. So that's the function we're gonna to have to integrate over Xi. And then we're gonna multiply it by those other terms we get from the H, H conjugate and then integrate that with respect to D, uh, delta Xi. So now we need to calculate the integral of j, j1 of Xi minus delta Xi over two, which is Xi one, Xi plus delta Xi over two, which is Xi two, d Xi. Well, we just saw on the previous board, that quantity is equal to I zero times one if Xi is between minus W minus absolute value of delta Xi over two and W minus absolute value of delta Xi all over two. So what is that gonna be? Well, notice that uh, these limits uh, only are gonna, they're gonna go to zero when delta Xi goes to W. So this is gonna be equal to what? I zero, and this entire integral here will just be two times the upper limit because of the symmetry. So that'll just be I zero times W minus absolute value of delta Xi, and that's if only if the absolute value of delta psi is less than or equal to w. Once uh, delta psi exceeds w, then going back to the previous board, the overlap between these two rectangles uh, is zero. And therefore, we would have zero if absolute value of delta psi is greater than w. So that's that integral. Then we need to calculate the integral of this times phase factors that we get um, for our propagation of mutual intensity for the case where we're looking at the output intensity. And that would be, let's get, we have the I zero here. We're gonna have an integral over delta Xi. Well, it can go between minus W and plus W, so minus W w and it's going to be this expression here w minus absolute value of delta psi and then that phase factor is e to the i we'll write it as 2 pi x over lambda 0 f delta psi and we're integrating over delta psi all right so that's going to be the integral of this expression now times this phase factor and let's see, this function right here is an even function of delta Xi because of the absolute value. So the complex exponential has a cosine part and a sine part, and the sine part is odd. Well, the cosine part is even. Well, the, we have an integral over a symmetric interval, minus w to w, so even times odd would be odd, and that integral then of the sine part would be zero, and that would just leave the cosine. So we can write this now as two, and use the fact that the integral of an even function from minus w to w is two times its integral from zero to w. So we get two i zero, the integral from zero 
to w of w minus, and now this is in our interval where delta xi is non-negative, so just minus delta xi, we can drop the absolute value, and then we get the even part of this, which is the cosine. Cosine 2 pi x over lambda 0 f delta psi d delta psi. And so in the PDF notes, we go through and detail this doing this integral. And what we end up with is I0 w squared sinc squared of wx over lambda 0 f, which is what we would expect for the x dependence of the intensity at the output plane of a coherent Fourier transforming lens with that rectangle input. And so if we do the same thing for the, the eta in the y coordinate, add that in, we've already taken care of the amplitude, so there's just one factor of i0, we end up with i2 max and y is i0. We include the factor of 1 over lambda 0 f squared. So we get, and from the other sink, we're going to get another w squared. So we have w squared over lambda 0 f quantity squared, and then it's product of sink squareds. wx over lambda 0 f sinc squared wy over lambda 0 f. And that checks out. That is exactly the same intensity prediction we get from the coherent theory of the Fourier transforming lens. So this just verifies that our propagation of mutual intensity formulas work for the case of spatially coherent light. Let's think now, we had this integral here, minus integral minus w to w of w minus absolute value of delta psi times e to the i 2 pi x over lambda 0 f delta psi, and we integrated that over delta psi. And that was for the case of spatially coherent input. Let's model a partially coherent input as having a spatial factor e to the minus pi delta psi over some distance lc quantity squared, so a Gaussian term there, and then we integrate that d delta psi. So this term here gets you over Distance is less than or about equal to LC. So what will be the difference? Well, one of the things we can say immediately, if this was about equal to 1 for all the points we're integrating over, uh, then we would just get the same results we had before. And what would that require? Well, that would be, so let's see. So e to the minus pi delta psi over LC squared. So if that thing is um is, is very very small e to the something that's near zero would be approximately equal to one so if delta psi the magnitude of that is much less than lc but what's the biggest that delta psi can be well it goes from plus and minus w so the magnitude of it magnitude of delta psi if that's much much less than lc then this this term is essentially one and turning that around since the biggest that delta psi can be in amplitude, magnitude is w, that would mean that we could say lc is much, much bigger than w. Then we get the same result as before. Uh, and that makes sense. That's just saying if the, spatial, if the input is spatially coherent over distances which are much larger than the actual extent of the input, well, then the input looks spatially coherent. There's no difference between the partial coherence result and the perfectly spatial coherent monochromatic input result because the it's so uh, it, it's effectively spatially coherent over the entire input 
That's one way to look at it. Or another way is a little more formal. Uh, we could look at this as the inverse Fourier transform of the product of two functions. And so the convolution theorem tells us that's going to be a convolution between two Fourier transforms. And let's see, this first term gave us a, not worry about constants, it gave us a sinc squared of Wx over lambda 0f. And the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is another Gaussian, and leaving off constants, that's e to the minus pi lc times u squared, but uh, u is x over lambda 0f. And those would be convolved. Well, if this was approximately a delta function, uh, then, then we would get the same same result. Or another way to look at it, the width of the sink is what? Well, it's where this argument is equal to 1. That's where x is equal to lambda 0 f over w. So lambda 0 f over w. And if that width of the sink is much, much bigger than the width of this function, this blurring function. And that width is lambda 0 f over LC, then convolution with this function would be essentially the same as convolution with a delta function. And turning that around, inverting things, uh, that 1 over W is much, much greater than 1 over LC. That means that LC is much, much greater than W. We get the same result. So the takeaway is that the Fourier transforming lens to get a Fourier transform, it requires spatial coherence over the entire input. Okay, so very, very demanding on the coherence properties of the input to get the Fourier transforming effect of a Fourier transforming lens. Now let's turn to the imaging lens. The fact that our eyes and cameras do imaging quite well under incoherent light should tell us that we should expect that uh, the requirement for coherence at the input will not be present for an imaging lens, unlike the case for the Fourier transforming lens. So let's just review quickly. The imaging lens would be the case where we have a lens situated between input and output planes, a distance d1 from the input to the lens and d2 from the lens to the output. The lens has a focal length f. This is the z-axis here. Then, provided we have the imaging condition, 1 over f is 1 over d1 plus 1 over d2, then we know that light from a given point at the input will converge, be focused to a given point at the output. And uh, if this input point is psi, the output point is x is equal to some magnification m times psi, and we know that m is minus the ratio of the distances d2 over d1. Remember, the minus sign means that if psi is negative, x is positive, and vice versa. So we worked out the coherent impulse for this system, h of x and y for an input at psi and eta. So output point x and y, input point psi and eta. It had the form of e to the i phi zero over lambda zero squared d1 d2 quadratic phases e to the i pi over lambda zero d1 psi squared plus eta squared. And then another quadratic phase e to the i pi over lambda zero d2 x squared plus y squared 
And finally, a blurring function, little p of x minus m psi over lambda zero d2, y minus m eta over lambda zero d2. Where, this is a little p, where big P of X and Y is the lens pupil function. And then little p of U and V is the integral big P of X and Y e to the minus i 2 pi ux plus dy dx dy. Okay, so if, for example, the pupil function was uh, a product of rex, so it was a square lens, which is not that common, but easier to do the calculations for, usually we would have a circular lens, uh, then this inverse Fourier transform would give us a product of sinks at a width determined by the inverse of the width of the lens, or the aperture of the lens. So let's look at the relatively simple case. The lens pupil, P of X and Y, is a product of two rects. Rect X over A. Rect Y over A. A little more realistic would be to have a circular lens rather than a square lens, but it's easier to do the math. And we get very similar results. So we'll take a rectangular or square lens. And then the Fourier transform, P of U and V, really the inverse Fourier transform, is going to be, well, we just use the scaling theorem here. We'll have A squared sink AU sink AV. And so in that case, our little p at x minus m psi over lambda 0 d2, y minus m eta over lambda 0 d2 is going to be uh, we got this a squared out in front, and then a times u. Well, u, if this is your u, so it's going to be this times a, and we can represent that. Instead of multiplying by a, we can divide by 1 over a. In other words, divide the denominator by a, and we get the same effect. So we'll have sink x minus m psi over lambda 0 d2 over a, that's the same as multiplying by a. And then we'll have another sink for y, y minus m eta over lambda zero d2 over a. So what are the pixel dimensions? Well, because of the symmetry in X and Y, delta X will be equal to delta Y will be width, the width of the pixel in those two dimensions. And what will it be? Well, how much do we have to change X to change this argument by one? Lambda zero D2 over A. So that will be lambda zero D2 over A will be the pixel size in the output. What about in the input? Well, how much do we have to change Xi to make this argument change by one? it would be lambda 0 d2 over a over m. All right, but remember what m is. m is minus d2 over d1. And so if we divide this by m, we're dividing by d2 over d1. The d2s cancel, and we get a 1 over 1 over d1 is, is d1. And so we get that the input pixel size, delta xi is equal to delta eta, will be lambda 0 d1 over a. And of course, this is just the, the results we had 
previously where we kind of generically said that uh, this was the resolution in the input or object plane and this in the output or image plane. Now, let's see what happens if we have spatially incoherent input. Well, let's see. Let's go back to the previous page. We got a, a bunch of phase factors here. When we go to spatially incoherent input, we just take the magnitude squared of this coherent impulse response. So it's going to get rid of all these phase factors. Down here, we're just going to have lambda 0 squared d1, d2 squared. And then we're going to have this the magnitude squared of this little p function. So the real magic of the imaging lens comes from this little p function. That's what gives us the resolution. It's these sinks. So it's the amplitude of the impulse response that gives us the primary uh, effect for the imaging lens, while it was the phase of the impulse response that gave us the primary effect for the Fourier transforming lens. So not surprisingly, this is why the imaging lens still works with incoherent light. Magnitude of h of x and y psi and eta squared is going to be, so for incoherent light, we got that factor of k. Right, we say we've got the lambda 0 uh, squared d1, d2, and we have the magnitude squared of that. And then we just have the magnitude squared of little p. which in our particular example, we can write as, we have k, um, we've got this uh, a squared term there, then we take the magnitude squared of that, we get a to the fourth. And then we've got in the denominator, this lambda zero squared t1 e2 quantity squared and then we've got sink squared of x minus m psi over <clears throat> lambda zero d2 over a and similar over the y y minus m eta over lambda zero d2 over a so we're essentially going to get the same uh, width for the, the output pixels, for the resolution. It's going to be the same. We just, instead of having a, uh, an amplitude that's proportional to these sinks, we're going to have an intensity proportional to those sinks squared. So the key is that if the properties of the coherent system depend on the phase of the impulse response, those are going to be lost in the incoherent system. But if the important properties depend on the amplitude of the impulse response, well, those will carry over to the incoherent system. So what happens for the imaging lens if we have partial spatial coherence? OK, well, let's see. We're going to then have to work with the formula h of for the output intensity. We're going to have h of x, y, psi 1, eta 1, h conjugate of x, y, psi 2, eta 2. And what will those look like? Uh, that's going to be, as before, we're going to have 1 over lambda 0 squared t1, e 2 squared. We get one factor from each of these h's. And then when we look at the, um, the phases, well, we're going to get from, from this one, we're going to get a e to the i pi over lambda 0 d1 
psi 1 squared plus eta 1 squared, and also an x squared plus y squared. But then from this term, we're going to get a minus psi 2 squared and minus eta 2 squared and a minus x squared minus y squared. Well, the plus x squared plus y squared from this term cancels with the minus from that term. So we just get this quadratic factor there. And then we're going to get p of x minus m psi 1 over lambda 0 d2 and y minus m eta 1 over lambda 0 d2. And then from the conjugate, p conjugate x minus m psi 2 over lambda 0 d2 y minus m eta 2 over lambda 0 d2. And so what does that, that look like? Well, these are both sinks in the, case, in the specific case we're working out. And in general, they will just be whatever this little blurring function is. And that's going to look something like the following. So suppose this point right here is x, then we'll have something maybe that looks like this in the case of the sinks. Uh, one might be like, like so, and the other might be like this. And this one would be centered at where x would be equal to m psi 2 and this other one would be x is equal to m psi 1 right there of course then these would be like say sinks with a, a width particular delta psi and so what we would we see that this this product is going to be zero if either of these two points is farther away from x than the size of a pixel in other words if x minus m psi 1 is less than or equal to approximately d lambda 0 d2 over a for the case of a, a rectangular aperture, uh, square aperture really of width a, and m psi 2 minus x is also less than or equal to lambda 0 d2 over a. So that just says that both of these sinks are within this distance, this resolution distance, lambda 0 d2 over a of the point x. And therefore, that means that the distance between the peaks of these two sink functions in this example, we could just get as magnitude of m psi 2 minus psi 1 must be less than or equal to twice that width, 2 lambda 0 d2 over a. That just says, right, if this, if that width is some delta psi, then this width can be at most some delta psi, and then of course the width between the two peaks is twice delta psi. So we must have the input must be coherent over a delta psi on the order of this value, 2 lambda 0 d1 over a, which is basically 2 pixels width. And then the system would behave as a coherent imaging system. So that can be a pretty small distance. We don't need very coherent light to get the same effects that we would get with fully coherent light. It only needs to be spatially coherent over a distance of about two resolution cells. So as opposed to the Fourier transforming lens, which had a very strict requirement for coherence, spatial coherence over the entire input for the imaging system to get an, an output that's the same as we would get with a coherent imaging system, we only need coherence over basically a couple of pixels. Let's see, with an 
incoherent imaging system, the output intensity, I2 of x and y, is equal to k times the integral over the input of the magnitude squared of h of x, y, psi, and eta, magnitude squared of that. Right? So that's just the idea that the impulse response for incoherent uh, incoherent system is the magnitude squared, essentially, of the coherent impulse response. And for our simple model for incoherent uh, an input field, we have this factor of k we need to bring along, then times the input intensity i1 of psi and eta, and then we integrate over the input plane. Okay, so that's what an, the input-output relationship for an incoherent system looks like. And that is that integral represents the sum of real non-negative powers. So everywhere the input intensity is non-zero and this impulse response is non-zero, we get an additional contribution to the output intensity. They, they never destructively interfere. There's never any subtraction. On the other hand, for a coherent system, the output intensity is the magnitude squared of the output field, which is the integral of the coherent impulse response, h of x, y, psi, and eta, times the input field amplitude, g1 of psi and eta, integrated over the input plane, and then you take the magnitude squared of that. Well, that is the magnitude squared of a sum of complex amplitudes. So when you sum complex numbers, you can get destructive interference. They can basically cancel each other out. So you could have a pixel that was very brightly illuminated, uh, but when you did this integral here, you'd sum up a bunch of phasers, basically, that would add up to zero. So, for example, imagine we had a surface. So here's the z coordinate, and then these are the psi and eta coordinates in this plane. And um, let's we'll suppose this here is your input pixel resolution. But the surface on the scale of that resolution is some function z of psi and eta. It's a rough surface. So then imagine that light will assume that the illumination is coming from the same location as the, as the imaging lens. So, for example, on one of these big peaks here, light would come in, bounce off, and go back. Whereas in one of these valleys, light would come in and travel further until it bounced off and came back. And so this would introduce a phase shift for these two contributions. The phase is a function psi and eta would be where we'd have a round trip here. Um, now it would be a little different if the illumination point was somewhere else. The geometry would be a little different, but the same idea would apply. So we'll do the case where the illumination is coming from the camera. There'd be a phase shift that would look like this. Minus 2 times 2 pi, or 4 pi, over lambda zero times z of psi and eta. Why is that? Well, the factor of two times two pi is because you got a round trip effect here. And this just says if z is positive, you get a negative phase shift. That means you have less distance to travel. So there's less total phase shift from that part contribution to the pixel than for a place where z is negative, you got much more total phase shift, so then minus minus would be plus. So that we're using z is equal to zero, this plane, as our phase reference, and it just shows that on a rough surface, points that are towards the camera will give you positive z, a negative phase shift points away 
farther away from the camera will give you a, uh, a, a negative Z will give you a positive phase shift. So negative phase shift for positive Z, positive phase shift for negative Z. And then you're going to integrate that over this pixel in this operation right here. So you're going to get something that's going to, if we imagine that all of these little sub-pixels here uh, have the same amplitude, but just these different phase effects, then you're going to get something that looks like this, the integral over the pixel of E to the I V psi eta the psi the eta magnitude squared. What does that look like? Well, it could be very big. These could all add up in phase. Or it could be zero. These could all add up out of phase. And that is what gives us the phenomenon of called speckle. So in the notes, we look at this problem. Imagine we have a square pixel here. And then we divide that up conceptually into a number of subpixels. And we imagine that each of these subpixels has associated with it a phase shift, phi1, phi2, etc all the way up to phi sub big N. So this is some pixel and something like that we'll call a sub pixel. So the pixel amplitude, if we assume constant uh, amplitude of the illuminating field, it's gonna look like this. A e to the i theta, so some complex these are amplitude, and we'll write this as a0 over the square root of big N, the sum k equals 1 to big N, e to the i phi k. Phi k is the subpixels phase shift. And we, could, we use this uh, form here so that... Um, if a0 squared is equal to i0 as the intensity of the illumination, then the total power illuminating a subpixel would be a0 squared over n. In other words, i0 over n. We would just um, divide the total illuminating power up over the n pixels. That's why we use that form. All right, and this is just a complex number, so we can write it as a plus ib, and then break out the real and imaginary parts of this. And the real part is a0 over the square root of n. The sum k equals 1 to big N. The real part of that would be the cosine, phi k. And then b, the imaginary part, would look the same, but with sines. So we go through in more detail in the PDF notes. We work out the statistics of a and B here, and we find that uh, the expected value of A is equal to the expected value of B is equal to zero, just because the cosine of phi, where phi could be anything from zero to two pi, is, is zero. And then we work out the expected value of the squares of A and B, and we show that that's equal to uh, P0 over two, where uh, we'll take here P0 will be equal to uh, a0 squared. And then we end up with a probability distribution that looks like this. Lots of p's here. p sub p of p. So that's the probability distribution for the power p that we will get a particular, the probability we'll get a particular value of p will, looks like this. 1 over p0 e to the minus p over P0, it is a decreasing exponential amplitude. Here's P, and here's the probability that we'll get that value of P, and it's a de decreasing exponential. So, where there's some point here where the expected value is your P0.
So that is a very interesting distribution. Notice that the most probable value of the power for a pixel is zero. No matter how intense the illumination is, the most probable value of the power of a pixel in a coherent image of that is zero. So here's an example. This is um, a Gaussian laser beam. on a rough surface, just a wall. And what do we mean by rough? Well, rough on the order of a wavelength. So this should be, if this was a nice smooth surface, this should ideally be just a very, very gentle Gaussian profile like this. But with this spectacle effect, because of the, the roughness, and you have this interference between the different subpixels of each pixel, what we get instead is something that has these fluctuations like this, because what we, the intensity is always positive, some x at the output, and this is power in a particular pixel, uh, but there are these dramatic fluctuations. In fact, the expected value of the power is equal to p0, and very easy to show that for this decreasing exponential distribution, if we take power minus minus its mean and square it, so we get the root mean squared value of that, then we take the square root, that's also P0. In other words, the fluctuations in a pixel are as big as the expected value of the intensity of the pixel to begin with. So the stronger the pixel, the more fluctuations. So no matter how strong, so even here in the center where it's very strong, we still get a lot of this speckle behavior. we get some pixels that are nearly zero, just as much as we do in the weaker parts of the field. So this is a, a major, um, most, most people would say undesirable aspect of a coherent imaging system. And if you want to get and reduce the speckle, then you have to do some sort of incoherent averaging, take many different images with different realizations of the speckle pattern and then average them together in, the, in intensity and then you can get around that, that problem. So whether it's uh, computed tomography or um, a laser coherence tomography or any kind of coherent imaging system, you're gonna have this speckle effect. That's a major difference between a coherent imaging system and an incoherent imaging system.